from the top rope, and the Great American Bash, I bid you all good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you may be in this great land of ours or around the world. Welcome to the $55 million studio on the Pro Wrestle Machine. Let's get into this issue. Through the use of the Pro Wrestle Machine, June 7, 1999 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Fallout from the death of Owen Hart. By Observer Staff. In a funeral described by onlookers as overwhelming, the Calgary community, the pro wrestling fraternity, and wrestling fans paid their final respects to Owen Hart at his funeral on May 31st. The funeral, which was front page news in both Calgary newspapers, saw both Alberta Premier Ralph Klein and Calgary Mayor Al Dore attend along with current and former wrestlers from around North America. Various press estimates were that between 1,500 and 3,000 people, CNN reported 3,000 but most reports were closer to the former figure, attended the most publicized wrestling funeral in North America of the modern era. Although funerals for wrestlers who became national heroes like Giant Baba and El Santo were larger, due to the circumstances of the death and the current popularity of wrestling, this was the most publicized in recent memory in North America. In some ways it was similar to the large throng of wrestling fans in 1984 at the funeral of David Von Erich, estimated by various local reports as between 3,500 and 7,000 although that funeral was far more publicized in regards to attempting to draw a large crowd of wrestling fans, while the location of this was almost secretive to not draw that kind of an element. The World Wrestling Federation had most of its wrestlers and much of its front office in attendance, as the company footed the bill for wrestlers and their spouses and office people to attend along with for many of the trappings regarding the funeral itself. The company rented three buses, painted up saying we love you on and we miss you on to transport them to the funeral grounds. The funeral was presided over by Reverend Andrew Ribby, who also performed Owen and Martha Hart's wedding in 1989, and the funeral for Owen's nephew Matt Annis in 1996. Besides just about every major WWF star except Steve Austin, who was reported in various media as having attended but actually wasn't there, those in attendance included Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, The Road Warriors, Shane Douglas, Brian Blair, Jim Powers, Dory, and Terry Funk, Tiger Jeet Singh, Killer Kowalski, Chris Benoit, and woman Chris Jericho, and Kevin Von Erich and mother Doris Atkinson, who lived in a trailer park on Stu Hart's property in the late 50s when Jack Atkinson who later became Fritz Von Erich broke in with Stampede Wrestling after being a football player in the CFL along with a former Melanie Pillman. In addition, there were members of the Calgary Flames, Calgary Stampeders and Calgary Hitmen hockey teams in attendance as ceremony which made people laugh and cry loudly at times, at eulogy spoken by Owen's wife Martha, along with Brett and Ross Hart. Martha Hart, described as remarkably poised, spoke about her life with Owen, while Brett was telling stories about the jokes Owen used to play and Ross talked about growing up with him. Martha had also during the week put together a video tribute of still photos of Owen's life largely outside of wrestling. Hogan got front-page publicity in the newspapers, but came in and tried to be as inconspicuous as possible at the event, which was held in a building that seated about 300 with most of the rest outside listening to it on loudspeakers. The WWF largely coordinated the event, passing out armbands to its employees and wrestlers who were allowed, along with Hart's massive family, inside the church. Colin Ray, a noted country singer, who was friends with Owen and his wife, sang three songs dedicated to Owen's life. The two had met years ago when Ray's son who has cerebral palsy, whose favorite wrestler was Owen and Owen met him years ago, and they became friends. Vince McMahon was at the funeral at the request of Martha and did at one point speak to Bret Hart in person for the first time since Montreal although the most in the family weren't comfortable with it. Earl Heckner did not attend because, according to Brother Dave, he didn't want to make anyone in the family uncomfortable. McMahon at one point had Limo come to Stu's house and had someone give the messages that he was there if Stu wanted to talk with him but that if he didn't, he would understand. Stu jumped up and moved quickly wanting to talk with McMahon. There were strong words by both Brett and Martha at the ceremony intermixed with happy stories about Owen. Martha talked about how there would be a day of reckoning, saying it was her final promise to Owen, but said she wasn't bitter or angry, while Brett said that his brother Owen was too good for the spectacle of what pro wrestling had turned into. The funeral procession included 13 limos, rented by the WWF along with 72 cars. Because the WWF had rented every limo in Calgary, the family had to go out of city to get limos. Newspapers described much of the audience as respectful, but noted there were some wrestling fans there who cheered at seeing some of the big-name wrestlers arrive and said that was in bad taste. Now that wrestling has faced the greatest deluge of mainstream press probably in its history, virtually all of it negative, 
we need to step back and see what has been learned and what needs to be done. What has happened up to this point over the past week hasn't been the slightest bit constructive. The death of Owen Hart has turned into a political game with everyone reacting, sadly, almost too predictably. The media has crucified pro wrestling for things almost totally unrelated to Hart's death, largely the direction the business has taken, using Hart's death as the catalyst to make the stories relevant during a period when wrestling is not only just a cute news story everyone wants to jump on because of its television ratings, but a huge news story because of a sensational incident. The WWF has largely been quiet because of the potential liability issues, Vince McMahon's first major appearance is scheduled for June 4 on Larry King, when it hasn't taken the tact of defensive double-talk on ancillary issues relating to the story. With all the media interest in this incident, you'll notice that outside the controlled world of its television show where they were able to present some real coded with a lot more fake and convince its own audience it was real, you didn't exactly see Vince McMahon or the big names in WWF or WCW talking about something that everyone had an opinion on. WCW actually issued a memo to its wrestlers that nobody in the company except for Gene Okerlund or Jimmy Hart, I guess figuring they are the experts at double talk as opposed to some wrestlers who actually may want to honestly answer questions given to them, were allowed to discuss the issue to anyone. WWF wrestlers were equally handcuffed. On the air they were allowed to talk about funny stories and their thoughts about Owen Hart's life, but none were allowed to say anything about his death, the circumstances of which weren't talked about in a two-hour show that drew record ratings for that very reason. The Kansas City police became defensive publicly, as expected, although they were extremely helpful in providing answers to the Hart family at a time when nobody else would provide them. A debate raged on about good or bad taste regarding whether or not the show should have been stopped, which everyone has their opinion on but there is no question the decision made left the entire profession, to a much lesser extent the local police with a huge black eye, far bigger than an accidental death from an ill-conceived stunt would have left it with otherwise, and one that isn't going away any time soon. It's going to be very difficult for any newspaper or television reporter looking for a colorful story or an easy sweeps rating story for a long time to do that cliché let's all go out and have fun at the wrestling matches since Nitro or Raw are coming to town, since we know it's not real and it's all soap opera where the pain isn't real, even though all too often it really is. Defenders of wrestling, as usual, have tried to divert attention from the legitimate points brought up about the problems in wrestling by citing that the vast majority of the issues brought up have little to do with the death of heart. All the same people that yell and get mad at each other have continued to do so only with a lot more ferocity and gaining a lot more attention from the outside world since it isn't a good week for the other side to defend the business. And the business seems desperate for this all to go away and go back to lucrative business as usual. If there is any good that can come out of a tragedy, and in wrestling, little good comes out of any of them and this would be no different except for the fact this garnered such an incredible amount of attention, would be to it being the catalyst for a frank and open discussion of the problems rather than running from them or pretending they don't exist, and then trying to at least get a handle on them. This is as good a time as any to make this ridiculous suggestion in the wake of the heart tragedy. Both the management of WWF and WCW, and ECW if they want to be considered a responsible part of this problem-laden industry, need to work together on adding safety guards. I have ideas what they should be to an extent, but the decisions should be in the hands of a committee that both, if not all three companies, agree to allow give up some power, to avoid the possibility, that if these deaths continue, it may cause new interest in governmental regulation, which would amount to red tape that won't serve any function because the participants, will have little voice in their so-called protection. Vince McMahon and Eric Bischoff need to spearhead this and work together, which of course nearly dooms its chances from the beginning because a wrestling promoter isn't about to give up power, voluntarily or otherwise that also guarantees this year will break all existing records for active wrestler obituaries. Anyway, this time the challenge is for the leaders of this industry to show some guts for a change instead of react predictably, and not changing a thing in a totally screwed up system, and call people names when they acknowledge a sickening problem. The wrestlers in both companies need to send representatives, because nobody truly understands the demands of the wrestlers besides the wrestlers themselves. This almost sounds like player reps from a union, and I remember the early days of unionization in real sports and with this sports-slash-entertainment industry being in some ways progressive but in labor relations being deep in the dark ages, I can already foresee problems where the wrestlers will end up not wanting to change things because the management doesn't want to and the feeling is any good aggressive work at changing a system lucrative to management will wind up with a lesson push for an individual vocal about widespread changes. There was a time only a few decades back when baseball and football unions were in their infancy, where player rep became a bad job to it because they always seemed to get traded. In this business, without a strong union, 
and this business has never even come close to having a weak union to begin with, it will only be worse because pushes are far more subjective than in team sports where the incentive to win is pretty high so the best players have some leverage because they can spell the difference in game outcomes. The WWF, as an example, has very cleverly made unionization very difficult and made its value in the stock market that much stronger because they've shifted the two biggest players from wrestlers Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels a little over one year ago, to Vince McMahon and Shane McMahon as they key players in the game. Soon to be adding Stephanie McMahon and possibly Linda to that equation, with Austin and Rock as simply the most popular puppets. When the owners are also the star players, it brilliantly removes much of the leverage of the rest of the players, particularly the former number one guy on the team who in wrestling has tremendous leverage, and ups the value of the franchise because no jumps to a rival group become insurmountable when the two big stars are literally locked in, due to their ownership interest, for life. So again, we're back to square one, relying on the good faith of people like McMahon and Bischoff. It's hard to believe wrestlers having the good faith and the two leaders to trust that really speaking their mind won't bury them politically. The odds of this working become even greater. There should also be several people from the outside. I couldn't give any names but one, who I'll get to in a second is the only person I'd trust to make it work, but has some suggestions where to look. These should be people who are not beholden to anyone but are experts in the field of drug problems and treatment of injuries, since above all that seems to be the business' greatest plague, I'd like to see one or two major football team physicians familiar with treatment and cause of injuries. I'd also suggest bringing in people who work in the drug programs of the NFL. The NFL isn't perfect far from it and pro wrestling won't be no matter what nor should that be the expectations. Pro wrestling can't be held to a higher standard than the NFL but because of its track record over the past few years when it comes to tragedies and near tragedies, pro wrestling management should at least strive to on its own hold itself to a higher standard than the NFL. The NFL has its drug problems and I'd have little doubt there isn't hanky-panky done by the league in some form or fashion. But playing in the NFL is a very high pressure, very physically demanding world with a lot of violence and serious injuries. In those ways it is very similar to pro wrestling, although very different in many ways such as far more self-reliance in wrestling and a many times more grueling schedule with no off-season. But what the NFL can boast of that pro wrestling can't, is that per capita, even with whatever steroid and painkiller use is prevalent, its mortality rate of active players is minute compared to pro wrestling. Even boxings is these days. Either they are doing something right or this industry is doing something wrong, but either way, there has to be something that can be learned whichever it is. And finally, I'd like to suggest one outside name as the chairperson, except he's probably too busy to accept. Jesse Ventura. That name may shock a lot of people who know my personal feelings on Jesse Ventura, based on Eric Bischoff's comments on Ventura, based on his own personal dealings with him and stemming from a debate last week on Larry King, that Ventura is nothing but a joke that people are going to start seeing through, who does what's best for Jesse and who talks out of both sides of his mouth and if he was judged by today's standards of wrestling he's be nothing but a mid-carter, actually that is a generous appraisal of his ring work, although an unfair appraisal of his mic work in a day where the latter is more important than the former, I have a feeling both sides would be adverse to that name. But Ventura understands business in general. He understands this business and the demands of it both from an entertainment as well as an in-ring participant level, and the economics that make it click. He knows enough about related business to see through the bullshit. Third, and most important, he's high profile and very vocal and he's not the kind of person who backs down in a fight. The last thing this issue needs is a committee of marshmallows. Fourth, he's the only person in America I can think of who could possibly make this ridiculous idea possibly pay dividends at the end. Fifth, he's a cut through the bullshit guy in a position that the natural inclination of all involved is to be full of it. For many reasons, mainly because he knows the business has no economic ties to the business and hopefully never wants to have them again the scourge of appointing most ex-wrestlers because so many still have intentions of one final hurrah, and because he's brought home long shots before so odds being greatly against this working might simply make it a challenge it would have the best chance. Hey it's still a complete pipe dream for all the same political reasons it was at the start and nothing ventured, and we still have the same old system. While I doubt we'll have a repeat of what happened to Owen Hart, we all know we'll have plenty of repeats of what happens to many others. It requires admission of a problem publicly rather than totally transparent excuses like everyone is out to get us because we took a huge chunk. Actually 7% if the truth were to be told off Monday night football ratings and the real sports writers hate us for it and it requires the want for management, and employees, to improve a system they are all making money in. And hardest of all, it requires a business built on con-man principles and run in that fashion, to be honest with itself and its public.
management has all the power and is making tons of money and its only advantage to wanting to change is that the cat is out of the bag, for all the money being made there is something terribly wrong with the system as it is today, and the deaths post Owen Hart and post wrestling being a big deal in the entertainment world aren't going to be buried to where they are only a big deal in the small little wrestling fan village. Costing money in the short run and giving up a little power may be worth it economically as this story plays out, because this profession to the general public is now considered more seamy than ever. Of course, pro wrestling, the long run is next Monday so nobody will see that, just as nobody saw this week coming even though something very similar as far as the media reaction, maybe not quite as big, but certainly very similar, had been inevitable for five years. Just as nobody saw Zaurian coming although anyone with half a brain should have seen that one coming for five years as well. Based on the figures the WWF has released and its quest to go public, which may also be held up several months until all the potential lawsuit issues in the Hart case are known about, the company pays about 13% of its income to the performers, a figure exceedingly low for any comparably sized sports or entertainment franchise. WCW pays 20%, while virtually all major league sports pay more than double that. The profit margin for both WWF and WCW over the past year was 167% for WWF and 145% for WCW greater than what the total payroll for the performers were. You can take the most successful franchises in pro sports and none would be able to boast anything remotely close to that. And to me on the surface I say, bravo for the owners because their job is to keep as much as possible of the pie at the end of the year, and if the workers are so gutless to not unionize in this kind of a business and fight for their fair share, that's their problem. But the surface is looking at this as nothing but a business. Last week hopefully brought some reality to everyone involved. With all the talk of buy rates, gates, six and seven figure contracts, hundreds of million in gross revenue and record ratings, the human costs have escalated totally out of control. The rehab visits, the near fatal car crashes, the overdoses and the flukes are way out of hand. When WCW added Thunder, we made a lot of predictions, as far as marriage problems, drug issues, morale problems, and on-air human errors for just plain being exhausted, not to mention an injury rate that would get worse. It came true even faster than expected and WCW is in a shambles and I don't mean just falling ratings and poor work rate shambles, although Thunder is only a small factor in all this. When WWF adds Smackdown in the fall, it will face many of the same issues. And the company bottom line will go up at the beginning because it's a deal that can't be turned down because you can't turn down network exposure. At some point there has to be a system of checks and balances. When Owen Hart died one week ago, it appeared to be an aberration. Like a car wreck, or a construction site accident or a miscue on the flying trapeze act at the circus, although they work with a the net. These things happen and it's nobody's fault. But as the week has gone on, the more that comes out, the less it seems that was the real story. It isn't clear who is guilty of anything tangible. I guess the courts in some form will decide that over the next few years. But in everyone's haste to do so many hours of live television every week, both sides are guilty of loads of poor judgment, which ordinarily doesn't have major negative repercussions except for storylines that make no sense and tired wrestlers performing in the ring. But sometimes the costs are unusually high and this was one of those cases. A professional stunt that had literally zero reason to be done in the first place other than to mock successful characters on the other side in a promotional war, being done by a complete amateur stuntman. A company still trying to rationalize the black eye it put on the profession by its handling of the situation with stories that get more contradictory as the week goes on. And every promoter I spoke with during the week not understanding why Titan was taking so much heat because, do you know how much money they'd have lost had they stopped the show? Comparatively little, they may have insurance for just such situations and if they don't, the show could have always been rescheduled for two days later since replay slots had already been booked. And some other things aren't lost on people such as the replay on Tuesday being cancelled, however, the replay on Sunday, which draws far more buys, wasn't. House shows several days later were postponed due to the situation, yet the live show wasn't nor were the television tapings the next two nights. Nobody can legislate against bad judgment, nor should they. Fact is, WWF has had, at least from a business standpoint, far more good judgment than bad over the past few years, although there was certainly some negligence in the system leading to the death of Pillman, not that Pillman himself isn't ultimately responsible for his actions, in hindsight and complete negligence in the death of Hart. And in one afternoon, they didn't necessarily piss away that economic gain, but they sure did a number on the goodwill to the outside world. And hopefully everyone in the profession will realize, in the real grand scheme of things, that is an insignificant part of the lesson that needed to be learned, so perhaps something positive can come from all this. 
among the plethora of mainstream media attention which included front-page stories in most newspapers and a lot of follow-up pieces. Brett and Martha Hart, just hours after the funeral, were on CNN with Larry King. Both complained about the direction wrestling had taken and how Owen was against it. Martha said Owen had two years left on his contract, plus an option year, these options are the WWS option, not the wrestlers, and that after the two years he was planning on slowing down his schedule. Both were highly complimentary of the Kansas City Police and there was an implied threat of a huge lawsuit and King mentioned that Martha had said earlier in the day that there would be a day of reckoning. Lawyers for the Hart family asked them to not talk to the media from this point forward due to potential legal action. Brett was also very complimentary of Eric Bischoff. Bischoff, when hearing about the news, made sure to meet Brett's plane at the airport. Brett had gotten a message about an emergency as his agent, Bruce Allen, had gotten word to the pilot since nobody could contact Brett while on an airplane from Ottawa to Los Angeles. The pilot passed Brett a note that there was an emergency and to call Allen. They didn't say what the message was other than for Brett to call him. He kept trying to call on airplane phones in a panic, worried more about his father than anything else. One phone after another didn't work, which made things more frantic. When he finally got through, he got an answering machine message. Later he got a second note from a family friend to call home immediately. Again, he was going from seat to seat in the plane trying to find a phone that worked and when he finally got through to someone, that person hadn't seen the show and gave him the message Owen had died in a match in Edmonton and Martha was in the front row watching. Finally Brett got a hold of Carl DeMarco, his former manager who is now head of WWF Canada. He told him it was in Kansas City and that Martha wasn't watching the show. Bischoff met him and while Bischoff himself was totally devastated by the news, he still gave him a big pep talk which he really appreciated in hindsight, had already set up a chartered flight at company expense to immediately fly him back home to Calgary. Last year, when a prankster wanting to screw up a WCW pay-per-view where Brett was a main eventer in a tag match sent word to the company that Stu had died. Bischoff also immediately set up a chartered flight to take Brett home and made it clear he needn't stay to work the pay-per-view main event. Even when WCW and Hart found out it was a hoax and Hart was still visibly shocked by the ordeal, Bischoff told him he wasn't expecting him to work that match although Hart did so anyway. Bischoff told Hart he could have as much time off as he needed to get his head straight. Hart has talked of retirement in many outlets over the past week. As of early this week, he was still leaning toward it feeling he couldn't get the passion back for the business after all this, although he hasn't made a decision. Hart noted that after reading last week's Observer, talking about how so many wrestlers talk of going one or two more years and retiring, as Owen had talked about, but that in wrestling nobody voluntarily ever walks away, even Bruce said when the time came to make that decision, staring at all that money on a potential new contract. He didn't think Owen would have walked away, said it made him think and that maybe he would be the first. Bischoff had already reworked plans for the July 11th bash at the Beach pay-per-view which was to be headlined by Hart vs. Bill Goldberg and pretty well iced that angle, recognizing for many reasons there is no way, even if Hart wanted to return this summer, that he could be cast right now as a heel. Hart didn't see how with everything he had been through, that he could convincingly get mad on television anything a heel would do to him that he'd be looking for vengeance for either. David Johnston in the Montreal Gazette ran a story on Carl Leduc, 24, who had a brief cameo in the Wrestling with Shadows movie as the big mouth youngster who Stu Hart turned into a pretzel downstairs. Leduc considered Owen Hart his friend, as in his second pro match, when they were wrestling in Quebec City, Leduc's hometown, Hart, although a tons bigger star, volunteered to put Leduc over clean. The road agents wouldn't go for it, but they were convinced by allow Leduc to win via DQ. After that, the two were roommates when they worked the same cities during Leduc's brief WWS stint. Hart told Leduc he'd only agree to room with him if Leduc agreed to save the money he'd be saving rooming with him rather than spending it elsewhere on the road. The rule was that after the match, they wouldn't go out with the boys. They'd order some food, go back to the hotel room together, he'd phone his wife, and they'd go to sleep. He said Hart told him on the road to meet his friends in the lobby, not the bars, and to stay out of the bars. Phil Mushnick in the New York Post ran a story on pro wrestling at large, noting Hart's death as an accident but the sensational nature of it made it the first death to become front-page news, saying that is the kind of news that belonged on the front pages for years. Mushnick criticized McMahon for continuing the show, continuing with his own ambulance ride storyline minutes later and brought up McMahon using Melanie Pillman to deliver ratings one day after Brian's death in 1997. He also criticized the members of the New York media that at one point proclaimed McMahon a leader in the war on drugs, citing his track record and current policy vis-a-vis -vis his TV guide quote.
Gare Joyce of the Ottawa Citizen, who did a major magazine feature six years ago about Bret Hart in Canadian magazine Saturday Night, noted that 99% of the people critical of wrestling because of the death of Owen Hart had those opinions before the death of Hart, never knew him, couldn't have picked him out of a police lineup that noted his death was a convenient springboard to talk about wrestling, claiming the coverage has been gratuitous, saying that lost in all this was that an athlete lost his life. It was this reporter's story seven years ago where the quote about Owen Hart wrestling only to appease his father was started, and in the story Hart said he'd like to wrestle until he's 30, then be out and be with his family. I wondered whether it was all worth it when I was injured at Survivor Series last year, this was actually the 1988 Survivor Series this quote is in reference to. I was doing an aerial move off the top rope, and took a headbutt in the groin. I had to finish the match because it was on live TV, but I spent a week in the hospital. I almost had to lose a testicle. I had just got married, actually he was married about seven months after this match, and wanted to start a family. It puts into perspective the risks I was taking. The reporter mentioned bumping into Owen at the airport a few weeks ago, and they talked about the story, and he brought up that Owen was still in wrestling past 30. He talked about staying for one more year. Joyce wrote, he gave the impression that he was tired, if not disillusioned, with the game and the story concluded with Owen Hart had to take some physical risks to stay on and collect a paycheck in a business that he cared for not much at the start and hardly at all anymore. Considering Owen Hart early in his career went all over the world to perfect his craft at virtually every different style, the only other person I can think of who did so much traveling around the world learning different styles and excelling at all of them besides the Japanese would be Chris Benoit, who is practically Japanese by training anyway that would seem to dispute that belief. As the week went on, most of the media reports as to why he fell had to do with the release button being pushed, either by heart in a panic, or because somehow his blue blazer costume hit it by accident. Nobody knows and will ever know. The latter story became more media-friendly as the week went on because it indicated Hart didn't make a mistake in the air that caused his death. The reason there was such a button was not only because they didn't have the safety hook that Sting and most rock stars use when they come from the ceiling at a show, but also because the idea was for him to push the bottom when he was a few feet from the ground and fall on his face in the ring. He was released early, but he was supposed to be released in mid-air, which is why this was a lot more of a high-risk stunt than was first believed. Most media reports, which included People Magazine and the Boston Globe story carried nationally by the New York Times News Service, also didn't understand that the Blue Blazer was a spoof on 80s babyfaces and Hulk Hogan in particular, Sting and also of critics of the WWF with his vowing to rid the WWF of the forces of evil, and not a clean-cut babyface character himself. The fact that as late as Tuesday, the day after the funeral, most of the mainstream media stories still talked about the Blue Blazer as a Hogan-esque babyface character facing the getting ready to do in the evil pimp daddy, despite it being one of the two or three biggest news stories of the week, unfortunately does speak volumes about the rest of the news we read on important issues. Similar to quotes here, Bruce Hart speaking to Alex Merves in a column syndicated throughout North America on the script's Howard News Service stated that I suspect, WWF management, was high-fiving each other after the, Monday night, show and saying they got the job done, and the story noted Hart didn't believe all the interviews were sincere. It came out smelling like a rose. That's the way we, most of the family was together watching the show although Brett walked out early and sat on the front porch by himself, all saw it. It was damage control and a bunch of crap where they say they were celebrating the life of Owen Hart. Nobody alluded to how needless and senseless the whole stunt was. A&E replayed wrestling with shadows on May 30th, which was really eerie, being that Pillman and Owen are dead, Davy's career is very much in jeopardy and Shawn Michaels will probably never wrestle again. The Canadian press interviewed one of the top stuntman and stunt coordinators in North America, Steve Lusescu who has performed and coordinated stunts for more than 180 movies. He said the stunt Hart was asked to do he had no business doing, and that only the most seasoned professionals would be allowed to attempt it in the movie world. I read Tuesday that Owen Hart had done this stunt several times but it's absolutely ridiculous to think that just because he did it several times that he was qualified to do it. You might be a stunt performer for 10 years before you even get the chance of doing a big fall like that. This is a guy who was in the business of pro wrestling and wasn't a stunt or circus performer. What they were doing was basically putting him on a wire rig, descending him from 100 feet in the air to a spot in the ring, then quick releasing him so he could get into his fight and into the script that he had to follow. That to me is more of a stunt performer's job than a wrestler's. He was also critical of the show continuing. Quite honestly, the fact that this show went on after this guy died in the ring is just atrocious. For them to sit there and say that it was a tribute to Owen, that's bull. It was a tribute to their wallet. That's what it was. I mean, 
He died in the ring before thousands of people in the arena and millions more on pay-per-view, and yet they continued with the show. Lucescu compared Hart's death with that of Brandon Lee, who he claimed was accidentally shot and killed during filming of the movie The Crow because the producers didn't want to have a qualified gun handler on the set to save a few bucks. In the Memphis commercial appeal, Jerry Lawler, who was one of the first people on the scene after Hart fell, said, after partially slipping Hart's mask off in case it might impair his breathing, I learned further and, and looked at his face. His mouth was open and his eyes were both, not wide open, but it was just a fixed stare. Both pupils were already dilated. There was no breath whatsoever. I just felt immediately he was gone. The story by Michael Kelly was that the heart incident was a freak occurrence and not a sign that there is anything wrong or that things have gone too far in wrestling. Corey Macklin noted this was the first time in more than a decade where a wrestler has died in the ring. In the United States it's the first time since 1975, worldwide. However, it's only been a few weeks. Lawler, when talking about his own ceiling entrances in the early 80s, noted they didn't even hire a big-time rigging company. Just a few local union guys who went to the top of the Mid-South Coliseum with him and put a harness on him and attached him to a cable. It was sort of scary at first, but everything went fine. Once you realized you were about halfway down, it went fine. The scariest part was stepping off the catwalk and dangling. Lawler, taking the typical pro-wrestling approach that nothing is wrong, said, everything has to be blamed on somebody. Kids shoot somebody in a school. They say, let's blame movies and video games. Let's not see how they were raised by their parents. A guy inadvertently pulls a release mechanism and causes himself to fall and so all of a sudden it's let's blame wrestling. I'll challenge any sport with physical contact to see if they've had less participants die. He really said that it was certainly a tragic accident. But it's part of life. I don't think matches are any more dangerous than they've ever been. However, in the same story, former Memphis legend Sputnik Monroe Rock Brumbaugh, now 70, had a different viewpoint, saying he can't imagine anyone being asked to perform the stunt that killed Hart. On this weekend's EMLL television show in Mexico City, they not only mentioned the death of Owen Hart, but talked about him as the Blue Blazer losing his mask to Connect in 1991, which was with a rival promotion. As you'd expect, there was heavy media coverage in both Japan and Mexico to Hart's death. New Japan held a ceremony at its May 31st show in Osaka with a 10-bell salute and Jushin Liger, who worked with Hart both in Japan and in Calgary, spoke about Hart to the crowd. While many members of the family were bitter toward Vince McMahon and the WWF for many things over the past week and airing the brief clip on Raw of his wrestlers and the family coming to the funeral and the buses when he was specifically asked by Martha and the family not to air anything was just the latest Davy Boy Smith's reaction in the media was that Owen's death was an accident and didn't believe McMahon was to blame. Smith, who is able to engage in light upper body workouts since recuperating from a fractured spine and a life-threatening spinal infection, was still talking about returning to the ring and dedicating his comeback to his brother-in-law. Davy's son Harry also wants to embark on a career as a pro wrestler and Davy is hoping he also could go to the WWF. Ross Hart mentioned just how enraged he was at Craig Kilborn of CBS TV for his joke about Owen's death the day after it happened. Hart was up watching the show when he heard the joke and called CBS executives and blasted them for the ultimate in bad taste. Even more tasteless was Dallas radio station KEGL which did its morning drive time show as a parody making fun of what happened to Hart with sound effects of someone crashing on the ground, etc. and playing Tom Petty's song Free Falling. But when Hart's biggest career push would have been his 1994 singles feud against brother Brett for the WWF title. Some would argue on a small-time basis his career highlight would have been as the dominant franchise player for Stampede Wrestling early in his career, where he did weekly four-star singles match main events against some guys that did amount to something later and far more who were thought to have great ability based on their matches with Owen that were really quite terrible in the ring. Witness Steve DeSalvo when he came to WCW. He also, early on, had a two-year run with New Japan as the top foreign junior heavyweight star and where he was one of the three or four most popular foreign wrestlers in that country. But his most famous singles feud really happened by accident. Brett was approached on September 1, 1993 about doing a feud with Bruce Hart. The idea for the feud was that Bruce would be mad at Brett for whatever reason since Brett had become a big star and Brett would refuse to wrestle him, to build up the heat for months before he ever got in the ring. The idea was that Brett would refuse, but Owen would finally agree to wrestle Bruce and get destroyed so badly Brett would have to take the match to avenge Owen. Brett nixed it at first, thinking the brother versus brother thing was in bad taste and also figured if Bruce did that to Owen it would kill him dead in the WWF as far as any future possibilities. He nixed doing it with Bruce, but suggested Owen, first, 
because Owen was by far the better worker of the two at that point in their respective lives, and also because his career had been going nowhere. Pat Patterson said that Owen wasn't the right guy for the angle but McMahon said maybe it would work. Brett went to Owen, who jumped at the chance of getting a real push, even though Brett still thought it would be in bad taste. The two agreed to work their feud everywhere, because that's how they perceived the business as and what it was at least more at that point in history. They were never together, never rode together, never went out together, never socialized in front of anyone trying to get the angle over. Even in Germany on the bus with the boys the two avoided each other. They were caught once. They were stopped at Calgary going through customs. As their bags were being searched, the two looked at each other in frustration and said a few words. A security officer who was watching on camera came in, almost like a candid camera moment, and said, I knew you guys really talked. Based on my own conversations with a lot of people, when it came to the decision to stop or not stop the show, people within wrestling were divided. I've yet to speak with one wrestling promoter who disagreed with McMahon's decision, although having written that, I'm sure I will this week. I've talked to wrestling fans on both sides of the fence although the vast majority thought it should have been stopped. I can't even give a consensus of opinion among wrestlers although I'd guess the majority favorite stopping the show out of respect to Hart's family, that it was a hotly debated issue, particularly the next night backstage at Nitro. People who have spoken to me about it from the real world, so to speak, were pretty vociferous about how callous it was not to, and it's pretty clear wrestling's image took a major tumble to the general public. In regard to the Raw show the next night, virtually every wrestling fan loved it and with very few exceptions, virtually everyone I spoke to within the business saw it as crass exploitation and were pretty vehement about the phoniness of parts of it. There was also a very weird uneasy feeling among many in the WWF about having done that show on Monday, and then going to Moline, Illinois the next day for this week's Raw taping and it was business as usual with nothing said at the show about anything ever happening. Bill Lyon, an award-winning sports columnist in the Philadelphia Inquirer, wrote in a story that ran nationally on the Knight Ritter Wire, if Owen Hart's passing is to serve some useful purpose beyond hypocritical pontificating, it would be to make wrestling put on the brakes. You can't ban it any more than you can ban boxing. But it needs to be reined in, to be reformed, to be dragged back from the edge. It needs to examine itself, and pull back from the edge. And it most emphatically needs pressure from parents. Wrestling has an appeal to children that is frightening. The allure is understandable extravagantly oversized men and women in exotic and bizarre costumes, strutting and preening and committing acts of random violence and rage. They are cartoon characters come to life. But there is an important difference. Superman and Batman and the rest of them are not crude and lewd. They don't have suggestive nicknames and pornographic routines. They don't debase, ogle and humiliate women. They don't lead their audience in chanting vulgarities. They have a constitutional right to stage their performances but a large portion of their audience especially that watching on cable TV, is much too young to be exposed to the raunch and sleaze that now permeates pro wrestling. Leon went on to talk about the barely dressed women who are slavishly subservient and surgically enhanced, and the steroid use. He also praised wrestlers saying they could give lessons to other athletes in how to relate to the paying public, talking about how many, out of character, are amazingly accessible and cooperative and that they can be both captivating and entertaining. But, Leon ended, they are being exploited, asked to do increasingly perilous stunts, asked to sell their bodies at auction. Some of them replay, yeah, but the money's good. In the end, all that gets you is a fancier coffin. And finally, Bret Hart's column which ran in newspapers throughout Canada on May 31st, I just can't believe it. My brother Owen has been taken away from me. He was such a wonderful human being and I will miss him so much. I've tried and tried to sum up into words what he meant to me. What he meant to all of us who loved him, it seems everyone knows by now what a great husband, father, son and brother he was. He was, without a doubt, the finest family man I ever knew. His life was centered around his wife, Martha, his one and only childhood sweetheart, and his two beautiful children, Uya and Athena. So many times I remember he sprinted from the door of the plane, his two carry-on bags in each hand at full run, worn out and weary, just to clear customs, through the sliding doors, to their outstretched arms. A man with no vices none. His only obsession, his family. Always his family. And oh, how he loved them all. I don't believe anyone knew Owen as well as me, except Martha. I recall so often, in airports, hotel rooms, dressing rooms, long drives on endless highways, his only dream was to come home to his wife and his two children. He almost made it, only days before moving into their dream home. He worked so hard for that dream. It's all so unfair, an exhausting argument with God. 
a long and sad meditation on fate and purpose and love. I'm so sorry, Martha. You and he deserve so much to have all your dreams come true. As your brother, you can hear me, and I know you can. You would be so very proud of her. I understand, even more so than before, why you fell in love with this girl and why you loved her so much. As your brother, I promise to watch over Athena and Uya. To be there for them. To try my best to make up for your absence. To tell them about you and to never let them wonder what you were like. To help Martha forever and to ensure what you wanted the most, that Uya and Athena are raised with respect and love and that they'll be guided by your spirit to have integrity and conscience. That they will make you proud. Martha wouldn't have it any other way. Neither will I. My mother and father, I know what he meant to you to all of us hearts, and I hope, in our sadness, we can find some way to overcome this tragedy and move on again. The hearts are loved and admired for our strength. This will be a true test. We all have so many wonderful and beautiful thoughts and memories of Owen, I wouldn't know where to start. I can't. I've concluded that we can only hold on to all those memories and like our last brother Dean, we will laugh and smile and talk endlessly of how you made this world a better place. Owen, you are the funniest person I ever knew. I thank you for that. I will smile to myself forever at all the funny things you did. A prankster? Nobody but all of us who knew you will ever understand how hilarious it was to be around you. Prank me anytime, Owen. I'll be waiting for your call. You were a great man who never, ever lost his heart of a child. I will hold dear my memories of all the places, distant lands and people we saw together. The sunset in Guam. The breathtaking beauty of Cape Town, South Africa. Our hell ride to the Taj Mahal in India. The serenity and beauty of the Hong Kong skyline. The harsh realities of Hiroshima and Auschwitz, where we paid our silent respect, and maybe more importantly our trip to Jerusalem. The ceaseless wonder. For, like Jesus, nailed to the cross, to a grid of paradoxes. You balanced yourself between the torment of not knowing your mission and the joy you took in carrying it out. Owen, you have all the answers now. I remember always being your protector. Looking out for you. I feel my heartache and my eyes begin to sting when I think, why wasn't I there to protect you in the Kemper Arena in Kansas City last Sunday? To question if this was really necessary. Shame on you, Vince McMahon. Owen, I loved wrestling with you. You were a great wrestler from start to finish and millions of your fans will never let that be forgotten. Maybe it's not important, almost kind of meaningless, but I know you were proud of your accomplishments as I was, and you were one of the greatest athletes to ever step foot in a wrestling ring. Everyone has a song in their heart. May Families has always been professional wrestling. The hardest aspect of it was always the never-ending loneliness. In reflection of that both you and I understood from the very start that we were singing a very sad song. But neither of us, even at this dark hour, are shamed at having sung that song. For, no matter what anyone ever thinks, Owen, yours will always be the most beautiful song I've ever heard. I'm lonely for you already. The world loved you very much and we will all miss you for a very long time. Your loving brother, Brett. Speaking of Jesse Ventura, the NBC movie on his life that aired on May 23rd, which he had nothing to do with and complained loudly about that point, was almost universally panned for not only being a boring movie about a man whose life story is anything but boring, but for its ridiculous inaccuracies. In the AP review I read, they talked about all the inaccuracies as it regarded Ventura's running for governor and didn't even know how ridiculously fictitious the portrayal of his career as a wrestler was. It drew a 6.0 rating, a huge disappointment, which put it in a distant third among the three major networks, behind a 12.1 by a movie on the life of Michael Landon and a 12.0 on a Cleopatra movie. Ventura's autobiography I Ain't God Time to Bleed was also released this week, and Ventura was on a national book tour, which included a guest visit with Jay Leno on May 26, where he claimed to have turned off the TV movie early because of its inaccuracies and watched the NBA game instead. And he was asked at every stop about Owen Hart. Ventura brought up the need for a pro wrestler's union echoing the thoughts of Owen's brother saying he was a pro wrestler, not a professional stuntman. Most books, including famous autobiographies, are written by ghost writers, often with the participants having less influence in them aside from making sure they don't look bad, than you'd imagine. But it doesn't take long into this book to see it's the real deal. It's the same Jesse as everywhere else. Same lingo. Same ego. Ventura has a principle which he talks about in the book, called the KISS, keep it simple stupid, principle and this book is a prime example. It's mainly a political book, giving the reader Ventura's views on everything, with virtually no details to anything aside from some amusing anecdotes. 
There is no question that Jesse is his own biggest fan from reading this book, but there is a lot of truth into his simplistic version of what American politics has turned into. From being a pro wrestler, it appears Ventura smells cons out pretty good, but also like many pro wrestlers, seems to smell them in places they really aren't. But you get his views on everything straight and direct. Ventura was criticized when this book came out for some of his youthful adventures, such as his admission to in his youth having partied too often, and even for having a major hangover the morning after his election, talking about losing his virginity at the age of 16 to a girl he never saw again, etc. I found that candor totally refreshing. Nobody knows where their life will go at 40 when they are 17, and to have your childhood held against you 20 or more years later is ridiculous, although that has happened in our society as well. His insight into the political process and those that inhibit it were simple but direct. Some have claimed these stories as a clever political move were there so he's put all his skeletons out on the table, if he runs nationally, there's nothing bad to find out that he hasn't admitted. My impression is that he's of the belief that at this point, people want him to be honest, since most politicians aren't, and that's his way to differentiate himself, so he wrote his version of an honest book. If you are interested in this book mainly to hear stories about Ventura's wrestling career, you will be very disappointed. Ventura doesn't hide from wrestling, or what wrestling is, but there aren't that many anecdotes about his career and it plays a minor part of the book. He talked about Billy Graham as his first wrestling hero and that the night when he was a doorman at a bar where he met his wife, she told him he reminded her of Graham, which made him happy since it showed she was a wrestling fan, and that he claimed he was Graham's kid brother. He talked briefly, as in very, about training under Eddie Sharkey, debuting in Kansas City, an anecdote about an out-of-the-ring altercation in Portland, very little about the AWA, the name Adrian Adonis is eliminated from this bio as well, and not much more about the WWF. The only wrestling feud he talked about that was relevant, was the one he never had, the singles feud with Hogan in the WWF that was cut short due to his illness right before it started, but he talked of it as a feud he'd have made a million dollars with, which based on the standards of the time, was highly overestimating his hill drawing power even as hot as Hogan was. He talked about his first match, with Omar Atlas in Wichita, Kansas for Geigel, and noted his last match was coincidentally against Tony Atlas in Winnipeg for the WWF. His version of the union story was that he met Gene Upshaw, who headed the NFL Players Union, and told him that wrestlers should unionize. He claimed that just before WrestleMania II in Los Angeles in 1987, actually it was in 1986, that two weeks before the show, he went into the dressing room and told them this was the time to make the play. Hogan wasn't involved but Ventura claimed he told the wrestlers they didn't need Hogan as long as they had King Kong Bundy, because that was Hogan's opponent on the show. He said if they went to Vince with the union right before the show, he'd have no choice but to recognize it. Everyone was behind him at the beginning but support dwindled when crunch time came. He said McMahon found out and they had an argument that went nowhere on the phone. He said for years he'd wondered who it was that squealed to McMahon about it, and in his lawsuit against McMahon, McMahon said under oath when asked that Hogan had told him, which explains Ventura's long-standing hatred for Hogan. Ventura lost interest in forming a union among wrestlers when he got his SAG card, claiming he told Vince if those guys are too gutless to do it, let them find their own way into a union. He talked about his lawsuit against McMahon, which he won, eventually winding up with more than $1 million, heavily praising Barry Bloom who from his role in representing McMahon has become the number one agent for pro wrestlers in the country. He talked about his leaving the WWF twice, first for negotiating his own movie deals, second for refusing to not do a video game after McMahon demanded he didn't do it. He claimed to have lost his job with WCW due to Hogan coming in and not wanting him around, which may be how Ventura saw things but wasn't how they were. Bobby Heenan came in and did a better job and Ventura simply lost his spot and pouted on air over it to the point there was no point in using him anymore. He admitted his own steroid use, claiming he'd used testosterone for 30 days every nine months, and was really bitter for Hogan for not only lying about his own use on Arenzio Hall claiming he wasn't a steroids user, but for going on the show and calling Billy Graham, who was the man who created the character that both had used, a drug abuser because Graham had problems from using steroids. He also claimed he gave up his gym, a Minneapolis spot called Ventura's Gym, because of the proliferation of steroid use including needles regularly found in the trash cans but he couldn't stop it so he closed the gym down completely. After his illness in 1984, he turned to the broadcast booth saying McMahon suggested it saying there had never been in wrestling history a bad guy who sided with bad guys doing commentary Jesse's role as the first is historically inaccurate, as there had been many going back to the 50s.
in my childhood Ripper Collins did the gig in Los Angeles, and it was popularized on national television by Roddy Piper on TBS in 1981 four years before Ventura. He claimed he decided to leave Vern Gagne and join McMahon in 1984 because several months earlier, on a show he and Mr. Saito were headlining as a tag team, the house from the previous month went up $7,000 but they both received $100 less than the previous month, claiming the reason their payoff was down was because Vern and Greg Gagne had to pay off his Aspen vacation. Ventura claimed to have been the greatest announcer wrestling ever had. Due to Memorial Day weekend, no ratings are available for this past week. Due to the Owen Hart death, we had very sketchy ratings information in last week's issue. Besides the Raw slash Nitro numbers which were covered last week, the other ratings for the weekend of May 22nd through 23 for USA Network were Livewire at 1.7, Superstars at 2.2 and Heat before the pay-per-view show doing a 4.37 rating which is up from the usual level. We don't have WCW Saturday Night ratings, WCW Thunder on both May 20th and May 27th did 2.9 ratings. Japanese Television Rundown May 1st New Japan 1. Shinjiro Otani and Tatsuhiro Takaiwa beat Koji Kanemoto and Kendo Kashin in 12-10. The last 8 minutes aired and it was excellent. They did the storyline where Kashin and Kanemoto couldn't get along. At one point Kashin started hitting Kanemoto with the Dory Funk style uppercut forearms. After a series of near falls, Atani pinned Kanemoto after a German suplex. After the match, Takaiwa shoved down Atani and lariated Kanemoto to set up his title match with him. Four and a quarter stars. Two. Michael Wall Street and NWO Sting and Masahiro Chono beat Brian Johnston and Manabu Nakanishi and Kensuke Sasaki in 1320. Chono called Don Fry out before the match to announce him as his new tag team partner. Fry went to all four corners and raised his arms a la Steve Austin. Since Fry's who demeanor is a copy of Austin, why not? Chono in the interview called Fry his new best friend. I guess that guarantees a split pretty soon. Nakanishi ended up being pinned after a Chono Yakuza kick and a sting clothesline off the top. One and a half stars. 3. Keiji Muto and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Satoshi Kojima beat Genichiro Tenryu and Tatsumi Fujinami and Tadao Yasuda in 1356. All I can say is that when he wants to be, Muto is right at the top of any list of heavyweight workers. Muto vs Tenryu chemistry made this match which was hot and had super heat. Finish saw Tenzan use a headbutt off the top on Yasuda and Kojima finish him by submission with his new facelock finisher. 3 and 3 quarter stars. 4. Fujinami and Kazuo Yamazaki and Yuji Nagata beat Koshinaka and Nakanishi and Sasaki in 1241. Another fast-paced good match with good heat. A lot of focus was on Nagata vs. Nakanishi as former tag partners feuding with Nagata made that pretty hot. Nagata ended up pinning Nakanishi with a bridging back suplex. Three and a quarter stars. May 8th New Japan 1. Chono and Fry and Akira beat Kojima and Tenzan and Muto in 1345. Tenzan must be having back problems since he's wearing one of those belts in the ring like Hogan, Savage, and Chono. Akira looked great as far as selling to carry the match. At one point they did a spot where Fry literally punched the hell out of all three of his opponents. Again Muto looked awesome. Finish saw Kojima deliver a Kojima cutter on Fry, who basically exposed the pro wrestling move and got up and just punched the hell out of Kojima and beat him with a choke. 3 stars. 2. Tatsutoshi Goto and Mishiyoshi Ohara beat Yasuda and Kazuyuki Fujita in 306. Match was fast paced with good heat. Fujita tried a standing Frankensteiner and, well, he came close. Goto pinned Fujita after a clothesline with a pipe. One quarter star. 3. Kanemoto and Takaiwa beat Liger and Kashin in 1119. Kanemoto and Liger, for whatever reason, missed a lot of spots which hurt the early portion. Since Kanemoto had the title match coming up with Takaiwa, they were teasing dissension as well. Takaiwa pinned Liger after the triple bomb to get himself over for the title match, and the crowd popped real big for the upset finish. 3 stars. 4. Koshinaka and Sasaki retained the IWGP tag titles beating Yamazaki and Nagata in 1638. The final 10 minutes aired. It was a fast-paced good match but the crowd heat seemed down for a tag title match. It just seemed the belts aren't over the way they should be. Nagata carried most of the match. A key spot was toward the finish when Koshinaka went for a powerbomb, but Nagata caught him in a triangle armbar. At the same time Yamazaki caught Sasaki in a keylock. 
the idea was for Sasaki to escape with the power clean Carl Gotch lift, but he didn't get Yamazaki all the way up, which hurt the spot, before dropping him to break the hold and making the save. Yamazaki did a rare pescado on Sasaki. Sasaki delivered two clotheslined and a Northern Lights bomb on Yamazaki, but Nagata saved. But Koshinaka blocked Nagata and Sasaki delivered another lariat on Yamazaki for the pin. Three and a quarter stars. May 9th All Japan. 1. Toshiaki Kawada beat Hiroshi Hazi in 2055. Even though this was the only match on television, it was edited down to 12 minutes because they aired so much of the press conference where Mitsuharu Misawa was named company president. Generally speaking, all Japan matches are never as good edited as they are when unedited. Kawada came back in real good condition, even showing signs of abs. He trimmed down so much that Hazi looked bigger than he did. They did a lot of tough man spots early. Kawada did some sick sounding Enzoi Gyrus. Kawada, of course, did a lot of selling the arm. Both men also did a great job in that they teased virtually every spot they did, which gave the spots more meaning. Hazi did a 22 rep giant swing spot and dropped Kawada on his head with a urinage. Kawada sold the spot great. Hazi tried a second urinage, but Kawada shifted his weight and landed on Hazi's face, and Kawada hit a high kick and two more Enzoi Gyrus. He sold the arm big time but got the pin after a brainbuster three and a quarter stars. Mexico. The lineup for Triple Mania 7 on June 11th in Ciudad Madero at the convention center is billed as Pero Aguayo's final match in Triple A, a relevo's increíbles match, face and heels joining together, with Aguayo and rival Cobarde in Octagon versus Pero Aguayo Jr. and El Texano and Sangre Chicana. This puts Pero in the ring against his son for the first time, in a match that includes Aguayo's three biggest rivals of the past year, Texano, Cobarde, and Chicana. In a match with the referee's hair at stake, Rapahasas will have his son's heavy metal and Felino represent him against Tarante's team of kickboxer and Thai boxer. Also Latin lover and Alabrije and Triple A Mascara Sagrada and a mystery partner, negotiations are for this to be Hayabusa but you know how Pena's business is handled, versus Electroshock and Abismo Negro 2 and a Spectro Jr. and Cybernetico, Los Vibers vs. Los Vados Locos in an Anything Goes Weapons match and Los Piasos. The new fourth Piaso is rumored to be Pimpinela Escarlata as Coco Rosa versus a new quartet known as the Spice Boys. Gigantic Kurgan from WWF has been brought in as a heel to eventually feud with El Gigante Silva from WWF. Silva isn't around so they are putting Kurgan on the Mafia team headed by Cien Caras. Kurgan's in-ring debut at Arena Coliseo, he had actually worked many years ago in Mexico under the name Goliath El Gigante and feuded with Connect for the old UA group. On May 30th saw he and Apollo Dantes and Universo 2000 beat Head Hunters and Negro Casas in two straight falls. They were also heavily pushing the Villano Tercero vs. Atlantis feud on the undercard. On the May 28th Arena Mexico show, Kurgan and Universo 2000 and Dantes beat Brasso de Plata and Emilio Charles Jr. and Mr. Niebla in two straight falls. The heels continued to pound on the faces afterwards until Silva, who was not billed as being there, came out and the heels left. There have been hints of a big Negro Casas hair match this summer against either Scorpio Jr. or Zumbido. On the May 28th show Casas beat Zumbido in a singles match and after was jumped by both men. The newspapers reported the match as having stunk, making the Mexican newspapers the most honest when it comes to reporting wrestling in the world right now, as they'll flat out say when something is bad. Tarzan Boy and Zorro appear to be in line for a push at Arena Mexico. Wolf Ruvinsky, who was a legendary hill in the 50s and an even bigger name in Mexico as a movie star and later head of the Wrestling Commission, is said to be in poor health with heart problems. An autobiography of Blue Demon came out last month. Demon started wrestling in 1947 as El Tosco, taking the Blue Demon name on March 31, 1948. His most famous match was September 25, 1953 when he beat El Santo in two straight falls on the EMLL 20th anniversary show. The only time he ever had his mask fully taken off during a match was against Tony Bourne in either El Paso or Juarez and his final match was August 27, 1989 in Monterey beating El Matamatico in a mask match. Atlantis beat Blue Panther to keep the CMLL light heavyweight title on May 26 in Acapulco. El Satanico beat Brasso de Oro in a hair versus hair in the main event of the return to Arena Mexico on May 21. Brasso de Oro loses his hair every summer. In fact, this was the eighth straight year he's done so. They did an angle on the show with injured Rio de Jalisco Jr., who was in the front row, with Universo 2000 who gave him a death crown. 
Great Sasuke retained his NWA middleweight title beating Ultimo Guerrero as well. Santo and Sasuke worked for Victor Quinones at his IWA television tapings in Puerto Rico. Oscar Sevilla beat Cuerno de Chivo in a hair versus mask match back on May 2 in Montanillo and was revealed as Freddy Rodriguez. This appeared on AAA TV. This week's Tijuana show on June 4 will be AAA with Latin Lover and Heavy Metal and Pero Agueo vs. Cibernetico and Abismo Negro and Electroshock Plus, El Alabrije and Felino, and La Parca Jr. vs. Pentagon and De Predador and a mystery third man. They are teasing problems between Octagon and the Pero Aguayos. There is some talk that when Pero Sr. retires that Pero Jr. will be turned Rudo to give him an identity of his own. Pero Sr. actually spent most of his career as a Rudo and was a better worker in that style until the fans just started liking him so much because they respected how hard he'd worked for so many years and it was ridiculous to keep him in that role. Unlike Ric Flair, once that happened, they didn't send him to a mental institution and constantly try and turn him. That's also probably why he remained one of the top five draws in Mexico constantly over the past 15 years straight. They are doing an angle where Shuchitl Hamada and Pentagon are breaking up their romance. In a big surprise, Hector Garza appeared on AAA television in an angle. They were interviewing Latin Lover and Garza was at the house with him. Several heels came to the house and Garza protected the injured Latin Lover and ended up being attacked, since he also has a legit bad knee. Latin legitimately is out with facial surgery. All Japan there was little special on the tour this week as the big shows are June 4th Misawa and Tawe vs. Kaoda and Kobashi, June 9th Kobashi and Akiyama defending against Johnny Ace and Bart Gunn, and June 11th Misawa vs. Kobashi Triple Crown match the next tour will be July 6th to July 23rd with the only major show being on the final night at Budokan Hall. May 16th TV show did a 4.7 rating and the May 23rd show did a 3.2. New Japan Seiji Sakaguchi, Masa Saito and Baisho were all in Las Vegas to meet with Eric Bischoff in regards to talent exchanges. There will be another meeting in a few weeks. New Japan had considered dropping its affiliation with WCW because of the inability to book the biggest stars and going with the WWF. Because the business has become so huge in the United States over the past two years, the Japanese deal is no longer a major plum deal for an American company. Standings for the Super Junior Tournament as of the morning of June 2nd, Block A Shinjiro Otani 3-1, Kendo Kashin 3-1, Minoru Tanaka 2-2, two two, Dr. Wagner Jr. 1-2, and two, Samurai 2-2, two and, two, and Masao Orihara 0-2. Oh Block B Koji Kanemoto 3-1, Gran Hamada 3-1, Jushin Liger 3-1, Tatsuhito Takaiwa 1-2, Masaaki Mochizuki 1-3, and, and Super Shocker, EMLL, 0-2. Oh the top point getter from each block goes to the final on June 8th at Budokan Hall. In the matches this week, May 25th in Kanazawa before a sellout 3,800 saw Atani pin Orihara in 9.37 and Hamada pinned Liger in 10.08. May 26th in Uozu before a sellout 1,500 saw Wagner over Tanaka in 10.09 with the Michinoku driver and Hamada pinned Shocker in 10.17 with a Frankensteiner. May 28th in Sabai before 1,600 saw Kanemoto over Shocker in 10.19 with a Moonsault and Kashin over Samurai in 10 minutes with an armbar. May 30th and Suyama saw Hamada pin Mochizuki and Samurai pin Wagner and the big show on May 31st in Osaka before a sellout 6,300 where they put the junior heavyweights on in the final two matches saw Tanaka pin Atani and Liger beat Kanemoto with an armbar in 2029. Before the May 21st show at Karakuen Hall, Atsushi Onita held a press conference at a Chinese restaurant near the building, and then Masahiro Chono showed up and the two went together in a back room without the press for 15 minutes. The long-range goal obviously is for Onita and Chono and Don Fry to be the top hill group in this promotion. Manabu Nakanishi talked about wanting to make Meng his regular tag team partner to feud against the two NWO factions. Kengo Suzuki, the former college rugby star who has been training at the New Japan Dojo and is expected to get a chance for stardom, is going to be sent to Bremen, Germany to work for the CWA May 15th TV show did a 2.8 rating and the May 22nd show did a 2.4 rating. Other Japan notes. Satoru Sayama, who was in his days as an active wrestler the inspiration for many of Owen Hart's moves, held a press conference on May 27, announcing a new promotion called Sikendo. He is claiming this would be a fighting style designed for street fighting and bodyguard work. It will have both an amateur and pro division and will hold its first tournament UFC style on July 10. Pro wrestlers Tiger Mask and Minoru Tanaka will be involved. 
there are a lot of negotiations ongoing between rings, pride and UFO. At this point UFO is negotiating with both groups but nothing is going on with rings and pride. Antonio Inoki and Akira Mater were scheduled to have a meeting this week to finalize the deal for Naoya Ogawa vs Yoshihisa Yamamoto on a rings show. Rings will also send Dick Frey and Hansa Nyman to be foreign talent for the June 29th UFO show in Osaka. It isn't known who Ogawa would face in the main event but Dan Severn vs Kazunari Murakami looks like a likely match. Inoki is trying to put together a major show for later this year with both Rings and Pride's cooperation. Gerard Gordeau will apparently promote a UFO show in the Netherlands. FMW and Atsushi Onita are doing an angle where Onita and FMW President Shoichi Arai are having business problems. FMW ran May 31st at Karakuen Hall before a sellout 2150 with the fans picking the main event which turned out to be an elimination match where Hideki Hasaka and Hisakatsu Oya and Tetsuhiro Kuroda and Masato Tanaka and Hayabusa beat Haido and Yukihiro Kanemura and Koto Fuyuki and Koji Nakagawa and Mr. Ganasuke in five straight falls. The big angle they are doing involves Fuyuki announcing that he is going to fire Tanaka the next time he loses a fall in a singles or tag team match. On May 30th, Tanaka and Kuroda kept the Brass Knucks tag titles beating Haido and Kanemura. Ryuji Yamakawa won the Big Japan Death Match title from Shadow WX on May 30th in Kawasaki in a no-rope barbed wire death plate glass, casket fired death match. Yamakawa was cut so deeply you could see his muscle and sinew in his back from fluorescent light tube shots. He also got thrown off the top of a truck. He was also power bombed on a light tube. Yamakawa won but after the match cut himself 18 centimeters deep and the doctor said he shouldn't wrestle for another six months. Mike Samples is on the current tour with Big Japan and beat Tomoaki Honma on the show. Yoshiaki Yatsu's Social Pro Wrestling Federation ran an explosive cage match on May 30th where Yatsu and Masahiro Kochi lost to Tarzan Goto and Ichiro Yaguchi in 22:31. The explosions were smaller than those from other promotions' similar type matches. All Japan Women starts its Grand Prix tournament on June 6 at Karakuen Hall with Yumiko Hata vs. Manami Toyota and Zappi vs. FT. Here and there. Naoya Ogawa's first American tour as NWA champion hasn't exactly been a success. He missed his first two scheduled shows on May 21st in Pittsburgh and May 22nd in Concord, NC due to his visa not clearing and came into the U.S. on May 25th. In Pittsburgh for Pro Wrestling Express, Promoter Jim Miller on a show billed as Sushi Night at the WrestlePlex had Brian Anthony wrestle a guy billed as Ogawa and win and was announced as new world champion. He'd cleared this angle with the NWA office. Shane Douglas came out and talked about how he destroyed the NWA belt years ago and why was it returning and wound up doing an angle to set up a three-way with himself and local DJ Bubba the Bulldog for this week. Finally Ogawa wrestled on May 28th in North Richland Hills, Texas against Dan Severn, going 12 minutes to a double countout. They asked for five more minutes, and time expired and the match was ruled a draw. Ogawa's plane from Dallas left nearly five hours late, causing him to miss his May 29th afternoon show in Somerville, Massachusetts for NWA New England. Ogawa did show up just as the show was ending and signed autographs for the Japanese fans in attendance. His final shows are scheduled as June 2nd in Conyers, Georgia against Gary Steele which will be taped for British Network ITV. June 4th against Doug Gilbert in New Jersey and June 5th in New Jersey against a kickboxer from Sweden named Fredrik Helm, which in front of an American audience smells like a disaster waiting to happen. The NWA's 51st anniversary show will be September 25th in Charlotte at the Grady Cole Center. Roller Jam will be shooting June 30th to July 4th in Las Vegas and then tape two more weekends in late July back in Orlando. They are going to an arena in August for another championship playoff series, probably in Biloxi, Mississippi. Jim Pony has booked the entire summer season's worth of storylines. The games will be airing out of order, as the first Orlando weekend will air before the Vegas games. There seems to be some resignation that ultimately the prospects for this aren't good. Matt Fury's Grappling Arts International Newsletter, 1687 Branham Lane, San Jose, California 95118, has an issue devoted to Fury's trip to Florida meeting with Carl Gotch. Gotch talked about pro wrestling, shooting, the Gracies, Strangler Lewis, John Pesek, Carl Gotch, George Hockenschmidt etc. He told that Lewis would have beaten Bruce Baumgartner and it would be no contest. Musclebound action figure toys are now getting bad pub for influencing children to eventually wind up doing steroids, similar to the flack Barbie dolls received for her ridiculous breast-waist differential. Want to send best wishes to the family of Carol Muse, a longtime wrestling fan whose family have been longtime readers, 
Godfather vs. King Kong Bundy and Sergeant Slaughter vs. Iron Sheik headlines the June 25th show at Lakewood Prep in Howell, New Jersey. David Zilch's U.S. Championship Wrestling in Pittsburgh filed for bankruptcy. The Memphis TV on May 29th opened with a 10-bell salute to Owen Hart, in Owen's list of title victories. We forgot he held the old USWA world title for a short period in Memphis. Prince Albert from WWF came back under his Memphis name of Baldo, while Sean Stasiak was still using his WWF name of Meat. Baldo had a confrontation with Mark Henry and also Vic Grimes. Terry Gordy's son Ray is working here. He did an angle where Glenn Kulka and J.R. Smooth attacked him to heat up their feud with Terry Gordy and Michael Hayes. The younger Gordy looked to have some potential. Nicole Bass was in studio with Brandon Baxter to continue the program with Derek King and C.B. Wyatt. They are teasing that Bass has a crush on Baxter. They were also pushing another Jonesboro, Arkansas DJ named Jason Gregory for a feud with downtown Bruno. Bruno and Kevin Lawler wound up double-teaming Jason and Lawler said he didn't like non-wrestlers taking up TV time. Meat came down with what I guess will be his new catchphrase, you can't beat the meat. Chris Cannonball is doing the Ricky Steamboat blowing fire before the match gimmick. The bill to eliminate drug testing in Oregon of wrestlers passed the state Senate 22 to 5 and is moving to the state house. The bill, as it is written, does not eliminate drug testing for pro wrestlers, but eliminates the testing only for national touring groups if the national groups offer choreographed entertainment. Wrestlers only have to submit a letter from a doctor that says they are in shape. In comments after the bill passed, Senator Marilyn Shannon of Brooks said, we need to bring back wrestling. It can be a fun family sport or entertainment. Senator Frank Shields of Portland, who voted against the bill, said that exempting touring groups from the law sends the message that Oregon is condoning drug use in those companies. But Senator Tony Corcoran dissented, saying the drug issue isn't even an issue because, and get this line, because steroid use isn't illegal, it is, and to show how little was discussed on the subject, Oregon has never tested a wrestler for steroids although the law allows it to the test are for cocaine, but also from Oregon regarding the death reported last week of Johnny Eagles, his real name was Roy Boyd. Women bodybuilder Trish Stratus has received feelers now from both WWF and WCW. Shane Douglas vs. 2 Cold Scorpio headlines Universal Wrestling Federation on June 25th in London, ONT. MMA The lineup for the July 16th UFC show in Cedar Rapids, Iowa at this point looks to be Maurice Smith vs. Marco Ruiz. Pat Militic defending the lightweight title against Andre Pedroneris, Suyashi Kosaka vs. Tom Lasik, who I know nothing about, Koi Salger, an excellent amateur wrestler from Iowa, versus Eugene Jackson, Jeremy Horn versus Kenji Kawaguchi, Shudo, and Ezer Fontes Braga, who had the recent match with Masakatsu Funaki in Japan, versus Paul Jones, USWF, Ron Waterman versus Andre Roberts and David Dodd versus Travis Fulton. The last two are scheduled as dark matches. While this is not finalized, it is largely expected that this show will be the first with matches with three five-minute rounds and using new judging criteria which may include a 10-point must system for scoring similar to boxing and allowances of draw decisions and the elimination of stand-ups, the latter clearly taking power away from ref John McCarthy. The judging criteria changes are definitely stemming from boss Rutan getting the decision in the Kevin Randleman match. It also appears that Rutan is going to go after the middleweight title, for the Randleman match, Rutan came in at 203. The feeling is that Rutan wants no part of a rematch with Randleman, although Randleman has said in interviews that he's not interested in returning. Ideas for later in the year appear to be in the direction of Rutan versus Tito Ortiz for the middleweight title, since Frank Shamrock hasn't signed a new contract due to UFC insisting on exclusivity which wouldn't allow him to fight in Japan, or anywhere else for that matter. The heavyweight title would likely be up for the likes of Randleman, should he return, Pedro Hitso and Pete Williams. It appears there will be a Allen Goes vs. Kazushi Sakuraba rematch on the July 4th Pride Show in Yokohama. On Brazilian network television, Carlos Barreto called UFC booker John Peretti a racist and blamed him for Rutan getting the decision over Randleman. Needless to say, don't expect Barreto in UFC anytime shortly. Paul Jones beat Larry Parker via TKO in 11 minutes to retain the USWF light heavyweight title. Ali Elias beat Brian Howell with a neck crank in 6.25 to keep the middleweight title and Brent Medley beat Michael Buell in a tournament to win the vacant lightweight title on the USWF's May 22nd show in Amarillo. Willie Peters of Ring's fame had one of the bloodiest fights in recent MMA history in Brazil last week against Antonio Bigu Ribeiro. Peters who was covered in blood, wound up getting disqualified for biting and they had to be pulled apart after the match. 
Shudo presented its 10th anniversary show on May 29 at Yokohama Bunka Gym and its top star, Ruman Asato, lost in his bid to win the vacant welterweight title when he was choked out by Kaoru Uno at the 4 minutes mark of the third round, or one minute before the match was to expire. Reports are Sato dominated early but gassed out. Of the eight matches, six went to three-round time limits but they had judges' decisions. Carlos Newton, who was very impressive in a UFC tournament last year, returned beating Kenji Kawaguchi at five minutes with an armbar. Kawaguchi is scheduled for the next UFC. Also Hayato Sakurai beat Brazilian Marcelo Aguiar via decision. Masa Akisadake broke his right foot and will miss the June 6 K1 Sapporo show. Masaaki Miyamoto had earlier broken his right leg and was taken off the show and will be replaced by former pro wrestler Yoji Anjo. The California State Athletic Commission is said to be considering allowing matches under pank race rules. Champion Martial Arts Academy in Littleton, Colorado is running Boss Rutan tournaments under rules similar to UFC on June 26, August 14, October 16, and December 4. ECW it is virtually a lock that ECW will be on TNN starting September 10th at 8 p.m. on Friday nights for a one-hour show. TNN stopped negotiations with the Howard Lipkett Group out of Las Vegas, telling them the decision was made to go with ECW and that they would own points in the company and that it would be a slightly toned-down version of ECW from the current product. The contracts have yet to be signed and all the terms haven't been exactly worked out but it is believed that the spots where men beat up women won't be allowed once it's on the air. The Acclaim video deal is said to be completed and will go into effect in November when Acclaim's deal with WWF expires. The trial of Jerome Young, New Jack, for assault in the Eric Kulis incident in Revere, Massachusetts started on May 26 and is expected to go to the jury on June 2. The famous videotape played before the jury on May 27. New Jack was removed from the video open of the show which is usually a sign he's done. Heyman indicated that he may be done or he may be used sparingly in the future and probably the result of the trial may be a determining factor on that. The July 18th pay-per-view will be from Hara Arena in Dayton and the only match finalized is Rob Van Dam vs. Balls Mahoney. It appears the plan now is to push Jerry Lynn Hart as a single and build him for six months before going back to him and Van Dam. There will probably be something involving Sid vs. Sabu, perhaps in a three-way with Just Incredible. According to Paul Heyman, Axel Rotten is being kept for a feud with Mahoney and after that runs its course, he'll be evaluated again. Heyman claimed he has no interest at all in Shane Douglas or Tammy Sitch at any point in time and that Chris Condito is done, although at some point way down the line he might be interested in bringing Condito back. The weekend shows were just typical shows, with May 28th in Worcester, Massachusetts drawing 450, May 29th in Fall River, Massachusetts drawing 600 and May 30th in Hampton Beach, New Hampshire drawing 1,100. Christopher Daniels is being considered for a regular spot. Jerry Lynn was back this week. His nose is all messed up. He's avoiding his needed nasal surgery because he doesn't want to take the time off it would require. WCW The June 13th Great American Bash pay-per-view has Nash vs. Savage for the title, Flair vs. Piper for the presidency, Piper is scheduled to win this time a tag team title match to be determined, Raven is out with a torn rotator cuff which may require surgery and is why they did the angle in Houston and why the title switch was moved up. Conan and Mysterio Jr. vs. Duncan Jr. and Henning Knobs vs. Hawk in a hardcore match and perhaps Ernest Miller vs. Scott Norton. Please don't ask me why Duncan Jr., who isn't very good and has little charisma and is so tall, was put into a program with Mysterio Jr. who is so small as the visual kills the thing dead even though Conan and Mysterio Jr. are two of the few wrestlers that actually get a pop these days. The May 9th Slambury pay-per-view did a horrendous 0.45 by rate or about a $2.15 million company gross. Based on last year's pay-per-view revenue, the company is about $12 million behind budget in pay-per-view revenue for this year. Nitro on May 31st at the Astrodome in Houston drew 15,004 paying $438,175 for another one of those tedious shows. About the only good thing on the show was Bischoff as announcer over the final two hours. He was doing a combination of shoots and work shoots, but at least he kept you on your toes and interested rather than the terribly predictable WCW announcing crew which never says anything. It isn't so much that the WCW announcers are bad but that they are either not allowed or afraid depending upon the issue, to say anything controversial. Before the show they did the angle where Paige and Bigelow jumped Raven to storyline explain that he'll be gone for a while. Eddie Guerrero returned to do color for the first match. They talked about his auto accident. 
If you recall, at the time it happened, they did an angle that he was injured by the NWO and it wasn't until six months later that it was an auto accident. He was also an asshole heel at the time, and now he's a timid babyface. Guerrero was not good at all on color. Kidman beat Hawk via DQ in 616 when Hugh Morris attacked Kidman. Tank Abbott and his band of merry men showed up like the gang that they are and Abbott said he was going to ref the Sting vs. China match. The announcers pushed the hell out of Abbott in commentary the rest of the night. Nobbs attacked Hawk after the match with garbage can shots and threw him through a table. Flair did an interview saying the elbow off the top was now banned. J.J. Dillon agreed with him. I guess they forgot the announcement made last week that the elbow off the top was banned. To make things more confusing, when Savage wrestled later in the show, guess what his winning move was? Mike Tenay played the Howard Finkel backstage snitch role. Kurt Hennig came out and did this really awful country singing. Duncombe joined him and made it worse. Conan and Mysterio Jr. came out and Conan's mic work was great. Then they did a pull apart which looks ridiculous because Mysterio Jr. only comes up to the hip of the security guys, and to the kneecap of Duncombe. Van Hammer beat Evan Courageous in 645 with a Cobra Clutch Slam. Courageous used the world's slowest version of the classic Red Bastion flying head scissors that it was about time somebody rediscovered. It's a nice move, but it's too bad Courageous was the one to bring it back because it was so slowly done. Piper did an interview and brought out Malenko. Malenko didn't say much until Flair came out. They were building the old versus new stuff with Malenko talking about how people like Flair need to step aside. It was funny seeing Piper agree with him. So after all that, Malenko walked out and Flair jumped Piper, but Piper made his own comeback and beat Flair up. Conan and Mysterio Jr. beat Duncombe Jr. and Hennig in 4.54 when Duncombe hit both guys with the cowbell. For whatever reason, this match had a lot of heat, particularly Conan's hot tag. Bischoff noted that sometimes Conan isn't very good and other times he is. He did look better than usual in this match and has been of late because Hennig can be a good worker when motivated and for whatever reason, Hennig is more motivated these days. Why Duncombe? Savage came out, bigger than ever, with Medusa and they announced Savage vs. Nash later in the show. They showed Canyon on the ground as if he was going to get beat up. The original idea was for Canyon to turn on Raven and Saturn on this show, but with Raven hurt, they saved the Canyon turn and did it a little slower. David Flair beat Eric Watts in 419 after Arn Anderson gave Watts a spinebuster. Bischoff noted how Watts a few years back when his father was running WCW, Bischoff stole my line about still having nightmares thinking about that period, was shoved down everyone's throat like David is now. Anyway, Tori Wilson is still hot and aside from that, these segments are incredibly bad television. Christy Wolf, Asia, is a waste of space. Ernest Miller challenged Norton once again. Norton came out and was creaming him until Miller hit Norton with a crowbar for the pin in 123. I think there's an inside joke there somewhere. Crowbar is a term from the 70s they used to give for big stiff guys with no talent that hurt guys whenever they hit them. Savage brought out a fake Nash, wearing a dress. Anyway, since Savage can't work at all anymore, the women took turns doing spots with transvestite Nash. Miss Madness did a cool Frankensteiner off the top. Gorgeous George dropped an elbow on him from the middle and then Savage did the elbow off the top. Since the move was banned twice now in two weeks, the ref didn't DQ Savage and instead counted the pin at 238. Bagwell beat Bobby Eaton with the blockbuster in 339. The segment with Flair building up this match was hilarious. Bagwell asked for yet another match with Savage. Flair told him he wasn't in Savage's league and didn't want heat for putting it on TV, Savage killing him and it being bad TV so he gave him Eaton instead. Bischoff ripped on Ventura during this segment. Saturn went in his tag champ to face Page and Bigelow. The one-on-two aspect wound up getting a lot of heat. Match was only decent but did get better toward the finish. Saturn used the Death Valley driver on both, when Canyon came to ringside. Saturn finally tagged Canyon, who went down after a punch to the face and lost the tag titles in 1144. It'll eventually come out that Canyon lost on purpose as Page and Bigelow and Canyon are now the ones who are going to do the free bird gimmick tag team where any two of the three can defend the belts. Nash came out in a big truck and cornered Savage's limo and poured sewage through the sunroof onto him and the girls. This was something you'd expect from Steve Austin on a WWF show. It was a great idea, but somehow it looked cheesy because of the camera work. Nash then said the segment was sponsored by the sewage company. That was funny as well. Sting vs. Rick Steiner in the cage with Tank as ref was anything but funny. They clearly hadn't trained Tank one second before throwing him out there to be lost. By the way, as a trivia note, 
The big bald guy that Tank runs around with is the same guy who ate Frank Shamrock's shoes after he poured nachos on him and challenged him to a fight the night before a UFC show in late 1996. Anyway this was boring. Tank didn't even know to count pins. Those idiot announcers were building Tank up as having the fastest hands in the world, as if. He's got a devastating power punch but his hand speed is nothing special. Anyway, he clocked Sting and left the cage. Rick Steiner beat on Sting but Sting made his own comeback. Tank signed a three-year deal. Don't know the numbers. They'd better come up with a workable idea for him and fast or it'll be another wasted purchase. I believe the Malenko comments and Bischoff yelling at him at the May 24th Nitro may not have been a shoot. Hogan came back on May 24th and suggested do an old versus new angle largely because he wants to shoot on the new guys about never drawing money. Of course in WCW scheme of things, guys like Nash, who are 40, are the young team. The old team will be Page, Hogan, Savage, Piper, Flair, Bigelow, don't ask. Of course this probably will fall apart quickly enough on its own anyway. Flair, based on his performances Thursday and Monday, for the first time I can recall, is just going through the motions without any passion, and has considered quitting again. Thunder on May 27 in Charleston, South Carolina drew 5,780 paying $125,575. Kazhayashi beat Lash LaRue in 8.57 with a sentence off the top. Savage was backstage throwing Disco Inferno and Scotty Riggs around. Fans chanted you both suck at these guys. Naturally they were having a good match at the time. Hammer beat Prince Aokio with the Cobra Slam in 4.58. Fans weren't chanting you both suck at these guys, even though they do. They showed Abbott at ringside. Savage and the girls did a terribly lame interview. Miller beat Vampiro in 2.35 with a spin kick. Really bad, which is meant more as a knock on Miller than Vampiro. Backstage Benoit asked for Flair to come outside. Anyway, Paige hit Benoit with a chair and Flair put the boots to him. Flair acted like he didn't care. Conan beat Kenny Chaos in 6.16 with the Tequila Sunrise. Courageous beat Lenny Lane in 5.20 with a screw plancha. Finisher looked good. Not much else did. Lodi was back at ringside during this match. Benoit beat Page via DQ in 16.10. Good match with a lousy finish. Flair and Bigelow interfered and Page left Benoit laying with a diamond cutter. I couldn't come up with one reason why Benoit couldn't have scored the pin if they were going to do the exact same post-match. Oh yeah because that might have elevated him. Finally Savage no contest Bagwell again in 4.43. Miss Madness did a missile drop kick in the highlight of the match. For the next week's show it was Kidman over Morris via DQ when Nobbs interfered, Mysterio Jr. over Hennig via DQ when Duncan Jr. interfered in a match said not to be good, Norton beat Silver King, Bagwell beat Brian Adams, Bigelow beat Riggs and Benoit beat Flair via DQ in about 15 minutes when Page and Bigelow interfered. Said to be a very good main event there hasn't been any talk in recent weeks about wrestlers being paid extra to do house shows. But that they're going to send DJ Ran and some of the Nitro girls to the house shows feeling that will help attendance. The originally scheduled August 2nd Nitro in Boston was cancelled. I believe the date will be in Tacoma, Washington instead. The feeling was the show wouldn't draw well in Boston, plus they felt the Fleet Center screwed them by booking a late August date for WWF, and the WWF would put tickets on sale for the event in June. The feeling from WCW is that in buildings that run both groups, they should at least not put tickets on sale for the other group's show during the build-up period for their own show for the obvious reasons. Jericho was there for the first time in weeks and ready to work at Thunder but wasn't used. Gene Okerlund's contract is up in the fall, and as Gene is wanting to do when his contracts are up, he's talking about retiring. Asya under her real name of Christy Wolf was on the Jenny Jones show on May 31st playing the role of someone who was a geek in high school and look at her now. Now she's no longer a geek. She's just a woman who looks like a guy on steroids with giant implants. Essentially, a different form of carnival geek. WCW is planning on doing its own kickboxing pay-per-view show headlined by Dennis Alexio vs. Rick Rufus. By the way the last pay-per-view kickboxing show on May 14th with Don the Dragon Wilson as the big draw did roughly 6,000 buys nationwide or a 0.016 buy rate. Steve Regal is almost certain to be brought back. Leo Burke was backstage at Thunder. WCW spent literally tons of money on TV ads to air in most markets early in the Raw show to plug Hogan's return on Nitro and the Tonight Show segment that ended up having to be cancelled. With all that advertising, the Hogan segment only did a 3.7 quarter which was the second highest segment, with no hype and being totally overexposed, 
the flare segment did a 3.9 Hogan was quoted in Calgary while at the funeral as saying Vince is a good man but he's gotten out of control and we need to reel wrestling back in. Super Kolo has a head injury and psychosis may have a broken nose. Jimmy Hart on May 31st reformed his Gentries, a popular 60s band which had some top 40 hits some 34 years ago as part of a 60s beach festival in Clearwater, Florida which drew 12,500 fans and included other 60s acts like the Buckinghams. Peter Noonan of Herman's Hermits and Gary Puckett of Union Gap fame, and that wasn't a clothing line for the first five months of 1999 WCW ran 104 house shows and this includes pay-per-view events, and grossed a total of $19,088,140 or $183,540 per show. House shows since we last covered this subject May 22nd in Johnston City, Tennessee drew 2,363 paying $49,965, May 23rd in Knoxville drew 1,886 paying $41,990. May 24th Nitro in Greenville, South Carolina drew 10,188 paying $300,163. May 25th for Saturday night tapings in Augusta, Georgia drew 2,311 paying $48,455. May 26th in Savannah, Georgia drew 4,587 paying $79,655. May 28th in Tupelo, Mississippi drew 3,634 paying $75,655. May 29th in Mobile, Alabama drew 3,587 paying $74,640. And May 30th in Baton Rouge, Louisiana drew 7,169 paying $136,730. The Tupelo Mobile Baton Rouge run saw Goldberg miss the shows due to his knee surgery, so Flair subbed and put over Sting in a show with very little name value stuff underneath. Brian Adams and Stevie Ray worked the house mic at the shows to turn babyface against David Taylor and David Finley. Merchandise from May 25th through May 31st was $210,557 or $5.27 per head. Major events on the September schedule are September 2nd Thunder in Saginaw, Michigan, September 6th Nitro at the Miami Arena, September 10th House Show in Baltimore, September 12th Fall Brawl Pay-Per-View at the Lawrence Joel Coliseum in Winston-Salem, which may prove to be a difficult draw, September 13th Nitro in Chapel Hill, North Carolina at the Dean Dome, September 15th House Show in Norfolk, September 26th Thunder in Florence, South Carolina, September 18th House Show in Louisville, September 20th Nitro in Cincinnati, September 27th Nitro at the Phillips Arena in Atlanta and September 30th Thunder in Chattanooga. WWF. May 25th Raw taping drew a sellout 9,755 paying $214,958. Show opened with a dark match as Kurt Angle beat Bob Utley. For Super Astros they had Poppy Chulo over Tiger Mask, Michinoku Pro Apollo Dantes over Show Funaki and Taka Michinoku over Super Loco ECW Super Crazy, and there may be problems over crazy doing jobs on WWF TV even if under a mask since everyone knows it's the same guy. For the heat show on May 30th, Test and Tori beat Meat and Jacqueline, Shamrock beat Jarrett with an ankle lock in King of the Ring tourney, Holly beat Snow in a King of the Ring match, X-Pac beat Bossman in a King of the Ring match with Acolytes jumping X-Pac after and Kane saving, Billy Gunn beat Viscera in a King of the Ring match. Hardys beat Goldust and Meanie and D-Lo Brown and Mark Henry beat Draws and Prince Albert, both for Shotgun. Raw opened with a confrontation leading to both an Undertaker vs. Vince and Undertaker vs. Austin matches, the latter a title match during the show. If Vince couldn't beat Undertaker, then Austin would never get another title shot. They built the whole show up to the idea that the greater power would be revealed by the end of the show. As it turned out, the show ended with a druid facing off with Austin, unmasking, but only Austin saw it, and Austin freaking out and the show went off the air. Fans in the building thought it was Vince under the costume. Maybe it'll end up being Linda or Stephanie. Big Show beat Gunn via count out in 247. Gunn tried to run away but Road Dog threw him back in for the choke slam. Beaver Cleavage beat Christian when Michael Hayes hit Christian with a pipe. Beaver, also called Harry Beaver Cleavage, comes out to a Leave It to Beaver type entrance song in black and white. You could tell they did a tremendous amount of sound sweetening throughout the show but none more than in this match. The Hardy Boys and Hayes were beating on Christian until the Brood made the save. They were strongly positioning Hayes and Hardys as heels including piping and fake crowd noise of them being booed. Post-match had some good high spots and the match itself wasn't bad as Christian is among the most underrated performers in the company. Jarrett won the IC title from Godfather when he hit him with Deborah's belt. There were women teasing stripping left and right at this finish. 
Vince beat Undertaker via DQ in 212 when Taker threw down the ref twice. Taker also attacked Patterson and Briscoe. Mankind challenged Triple H for a match later in the show. Bossman attacked Mankind but Road Dog saved. Dog beat Bossman via DQ in 235 for using the nightstick. Acolytes won the tag titles from X-Pac and Kane in 515 when Shane McMahon hit X-Pac with a chair as he was going for the Bronco Buster, and Bradshaw pinned him. In something that was totally disgusting, they had a surveillance camera in the dressing room as Mark Henry was apparently taking a shit, complete with gross sound effects, and D. Lo Brown coming into the bathroom acting like it stunk real bad. It's apparently going to be a regular segment called GDTV. Venus beat Shamrock in 311 when Jarrett and Deborah distracted Shamrock and Venus cradled him. Shamrock laid Venus out after and chased Jarrett. They were implying Venus was sleeping with Bass. Triple H beat Mankind when China gave him a low blow with a handle part of a sledgehammer in 650. Triple H destroyed Mankind's knee with a sledgehammer after the match and he went out in an ambulance with the angle explaining his time off for knee surgery and he's not expected back until late July. He needed it because he's been moving really slow of late. Finally Austin beat Taker via DQ in 8.30. After a stunner, the CM ran out and tied him up in the ropes when the druid came out and unmasked in front of him. King of the Ring bracketing is Gunn vs. Viscera, Gunn won Shamrock vs. Jarrett, Shamrock won, Big Show vs. Draws, June 6 at Nassau Coliseum Test vs. Kane, June 6 at Nassau Coliseum Dog vs. Godfather June 6, China vs. Venus, June 6, evidently to build up a China vs. Bass angle, Snow vs. Holly, Holly over, and Bossman vs. X-Pac, X-Pac over. This leads to a second round of Gunn vs. Shamrock, probably Show vs. Kane, I don't know where they're going with the other quarterfinal and Holly vs. X-Pac. June 26 that MSG is scheduled as Undertaker vs. Big Show and Austin vs. Triple H. There were no shows this week except for Molina's everything else was postponed due to the Owen Hart death. House shows last week were May 22nd in Chicago drew a sellout 18079 paying $384,607. May 23rd pay-per-view in Kansas City drew a sellout 16472 paying $453,893. Raw May 24th in St. Louis drew a sellout 14604 paying $401,919. UPN officials told the AP that the SmackDown show would be much tamer than Raw, specifically citing less explicit language and lewd gestures. Media Week did a story on the new television season. When talking about the SmackDown show, it wrote, Thursday's 2-hour WWF SmackDown is the show that may save the network, a deal where the World Wrestling Federation sells the commercials and UPN receives revenue and promo spots. In other words, the WWF is buying the time and keeping the commercial time for itself. UPN Supremo Dean Valentine fondly recalls how he used to watch wrestling with my grandmother in Queens. This is comedic soap opera for guys. Others call it a desperation ploy that degrades the network airwaves. It's disgusting and shows such a lack of responsibility, says one agency exec. And the worst part is, when it does well, you'll see another network do it. WWF had 17 of the top 20 sports videos this past week with Austin at number 1 and number 2 again. WCW had Sting at number 6 and Goldberg at number 7. Sable and Mark Marrow are currently involved in a contract dispute with WWF and not being used. There was interest in doing a TSN investigative piece on the state of pro wrestling in the wake of the Owen Hart death, but the higher-ups at the network killed the story because WWF is their top-rated program. At one point there was also talk of showing the ESPN Outside the Lines piece on TSN, because TSN often airs ESPN shows of that type, and it was also nixed by the higher-ups at the network. SummerSlam on August 22nd at the Target Center in Minneapolis sold out in about 90 minutes, $477,466. The Reader's Pages Owen Hart The death of Owen Hart really hit home. I sat in stunned silence while watching the -the over-the-edge pay-per-view when it was announced he had died. I've had the pleasure of meeting Owen many times over the years, the last being about three weeks before his death. There's no doubt Owen was a dedicated family man. I rarely ever saw Owen drink and he was never into the drug use that is so prevalent among so many of the boys. Owen was one of the handful of truly clean-cut wrestlers in the business. This brings up another question about the business. How far must they go to entertain the fans? There is no question this tragedy was an accident, but the bottom line is that two little kids lost their dad, a woman lost her husband and the wrestling business lost an individual who was a true professional both in and out of the ring. 
Owen, thanks for all the memories you gave us in the ring and thanks for all the memories you gave me out of it. God bless you, you will be missed but you are in a better place. Ray Gore. Wilbraham, Massachusetts. The death of Owen Hart was the hardest for me to take. I guess when someone dies in a horrible accident, it is harder for people to cope with it. Owen Hart gave it all. I consider myself very lucky to have tapes of him. When Deborah started crying on Raw, I lost it. I was glad to see that the entire Raw show was dedicated to Owen. I also noticed they didn't run any angles on the show. On the Over the Edge show I thought Vince should have dropped the ambulance ride angle. This should win the most tasteless angle of the year award. People were telling me that the WWF should have cancelled the rest of the show. I told them I've yet to see a car race get cancelled and you know they get their share of fatal accidents. I've seen football players get carried out on stretchers and the game continues. After Jim Ross announced that Owen had died, the rest of the show meant nothing. All I remember is that during the Rock vs. Hunter match, Ross kept talking about how much punishment Rock was taking when Hunter was working the arm. I just kept shaking my head in disbelief. How could Ross still call a match after what had happened? I was pissed at first, because this was all a work, and Owen's death was anything but. After a while I thought Ross is one hell of an announcer to be able to keep going like he did. Jesse Reyes. San Antonio, Texas. Response from Dave Meltzer. On the football analogy, it doesn't fit because you are comparing a guy going out on a stretcher, which routinely happens, to an instantaneous death right in the middle of the show that was being covered up to the live audience for whatever reason. The auto race one does to an extent as they have continued races after crashes that have left victims dead instantly, but this is an auto racing where death on the field is considered more of an acceptable byproduct of the action. The last time there was a death due to a crash at an auto race was two weeks ago at the Charlotte Speedway and the race was immediately cancelled. Wrestlers get broken necks and go out on stretchers from time to time and they don't stop shows, nor is there any thought to doing so, nor has there ever been any criticism of shows not stopping for that reason as injuries are considered part of the game. A death under suspicious circumstances is not part of the game. I'm still reeling from the Owen Hart tragedy which has affected me a little bit more than most celebrity deaths. Maybe it is because in my own lame way, I perform in a wrestling ring so when an active wrestler dies, I find myself a little more affected by it than when a movie star passes on. Usually when a wrestler dies, you can see it coming. Usually it's due to a lifestyle of munching down steroids, chasing it with painkillers and going out and doing a punch of lines at a party afterwards. The shock and surprise is small in these all too common types of wrestling deaths. The death of Owen in an in-ring stunt during a pay-per-view show is completely jolting. It's a symptom of a business that needs to deliver greater and greater thrills to its audience. Stunts and moves that would have gotten big crowd pops just two years ago and been seen as show-stopping events are now just part of the show and commonplace. The risk anti in pro wrestling, especially after ECW and putting people through tables and having people fall off the top of a cage, keeps rising. The death of Owen is especially hard-hitting after the last incredibly strange wrestling show where so many people were hurt and the ring became an unsafe pit of injury. After seeing the kid come so close to breaking his neck doing a high-risk maneuver to wow a crowd of about 150, I got a sick feeling in my stomach about a form of entertainment that has done very well for me and that I love. Just as it isn't worth seeing a guy break his neck and spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair to thrill a few people at Mission High School, it isn't worth Owen Hart's life to thrill 16,000 paid attendants and a few hundred thousand watching at home. Watching Wrestling with Shadows has become even stranger. This movie was shot less than two years ago. Already Brian Pillman and Owen who are seen throughout the film, are gone, and Davy Boy Smith may spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair, and Shawn Michaels, a central figure in the film, has already suffered a career-ending back injury. Of course the pay-per-view show still went on. The pro wrestling business still operates like it's this secret world with its own rules. Even with the amount of mainstream media attention it is commanding, All those years of pretending it's real and being so protective of the business has given the people who work in pro wrestling a mindset that would be repulsive to the casual fan and general public if they truly understood it. Many people think the show should have been cancelled and are probably right in that thinking. The WWF doesn't look good at all in not giving the boys the week off and eat a few losses. But with such great popularity, the WWF can't afford to live by the old carny rules anymore. With the light of the mainstream media shining on it, the business is being held to the same standards of decency as other forms of entertainment. Bob Calhoun. San Francisco, California. One day after Owen Hart's tragic accident, it still feels like everything is just a little surreal. My wife and I are fans of the Hart family and would like to express our deepest sympathies. 
the barrage of coverage from the mainstream media is disturbing. Jim Rome spent a good portion of his radio show blasting the WWF for not stopping the show. He failed to point out that the pay-per-view was almost at the two-hour mark before Jim Ross received word of Owen's death. Up until that point, I presume the WWF thought it was a horrible injury, but not a death, and shows typically continue after injuries. If Owen died immediately, and they knew about it, I doubt the show could have gone on. I certainly think the WWF should have stopped it if that was the case. But it wasn't. It was bad enough that the wrestlers, most of whom appeared badly shaken, had to continue performing when not knowing of Owen's status. But they are pros. The Undertaker's gimmick has been seriously impaired. How can someone who uses caskets as props and comes back from the dead by used after all this? In my opinion, it was a bad decision to have Austin drop the strap, which brought everyone down even farther. Then again, I could hardly pay any attention to the pay-per-view after Ross' announcement. Robert McMullen. Mountain View, California. I'm am sick, sick, sick of the pro wrestling industry. How dare the WWF continue the pay-per-view show after the tragedy? I felt the same way about the Bad Blood pay-per-view show. I forgave the WWF for not canceling Bad Blood. I thought it was an extremely tough time for everyone and the WWF at that time just made an error in judgment. However, the next day, they exploited Melanie Pillman. I lost a lot of respect for the company over that incident, but I continued to watch because I thought at least Mrs. Pillman sent out an important message, and she did agree to do it. But after being a loyal WWF costumer since 1984, I've decided that this industry is just too dirty for me. Owen Hart died in the F, in ring for heaven's sake. What the hell was Vince McMahon thinking? After letting the show go on, I swear I think Vince is no better than Satan himself. I saw Owen wrestle for the first time in 1988 as the Blue Angel. He was so special in the ring. His match that night against Barry Horowitz was similar to the legendary Tiger Mask vs. Dynamite Kid match in Madison Square Garden. When Owen and Horowitz came to the ring, they were greeted with total disinterest, and both were booed. Within five minutes the whole Oakland Coliseum was rocking as Owen showed all his trademark acrobatic moves. That was the first time I ever saw a moonsault. Everyone in the arena knew by the end of the match that this kid was special. His match against Brett at WrestleMania X was one of the best matches ever. Owen Hart was a huge part of my teenage years. I watched him every time I had the chance. When he passed away a part of me and a part of my teenage years passed away. I will never spend a dime on the WWF again. I wonder if it had been Shane and not Owen that fell, would the show have continued? The really sad thing is, we don't even know the answer to that, do we? Vince, take your buy rates and the gate you didn't have to refund and go straight to hell. Jason Singh. Vallejo, California. Bret Hart said that Vince McMahon treats his performers like circus animals. The pay-per-view should have been stopped the moment the gravity of Owen Hart's accident became apparent. He wasn't some dog in the Iditarod race to be replaced when he dies by a new dog. He was a human being with a family. Out of respect for his family, the show should have been stopped. Instead, they rolled him out of the ring and the money-making machine plotted on. Real life has to take precedence over continuing the storyline, but stopping the pay-per-view would be a difficult decision that would require a lot of courage. Once again, we learn that Vince McMahon has been shown to lack that quality. Mark Underwood. Yuba City, California. I can't imagine the sheer horror the fans at Kemper Arena witnessed when Owen Hart tragically plunged to his death. I think the WWF handled the situation well on the air, but can't imagine how the fans worried and wondered how he was doing. I can't imagine the other wrestlers having to go into the same ring that Owen had just died in and having to wrestle. Rick Davis. Bay City, Michigan. After reading the first three quarters of page one of the May 31st newsletter, I was moved to say something a bit surprising. I felt proud to be a wrestling fan. My schedule doesn't allow me to watch and follow wrestling as closely as I used to. Every once in a while I wonder why I continue to subscribe. Then, a big story happens and I'm reminded why. Your writing and insight is beyond anything that can be found on the internet, in the newspapers or anywhere else. Fans are all too quick to forget that athletes and entertainers have families and lives away from the spotlight. When something tragic happens, like the death of Brian Pillman, or now Owen Hart, it means a lot more than the fact we won't be able to see them perform anymore. For their families it means daddy won't be coming through the front door ever again to tuck them in at night or hold them when they're hurt. Your words help remind us of that for that I'm grateful. Ken McLaughlin. San Jose, California. What a loss this business has suffered with the passing of Owen Hart. Raw on May 24th brought me to tears more than once as I have never seen anything more sincere in my life. Frank Hasso. Whittier, California. 
on May 23rd, I was experiencing problems with my cable service and decided not to order the pay-per-view. The next morning at 5.30 a.m., as I went to shave and shower, I turned on the radio to the all-sports station. The station doesn't have high regard for pro wrestling and the only wrestling talk they had during the weekend of WrestleMania was how shocked they were that the first Union Center sold out. As I heard the host mention the WWF pay-per-view, I knew something bad had to happen. When I heard Owen Hart had died, I knew this was not going to be a good day. When I got to work and saw the photo of Owen in the ring on the front page of the Philadelphia Daily News, the sight of his limp arm sent a chill down my spine as I knew I was looking at a photo of someone who had died. As I talked to a friend on the phone, someone who I wrestled with and went to matches with, we laughed as we talked of Owen's greatness, his match with Brett at WrestleMania, his Blue Blazer gimmick and his time with the Hart Foundation. Not only was Owen a great wrestler, but it was his personality that really came across on TV every week. Owen and wrestles like Owen who combined talent, ability, dedication and personality are rare. He was a main reason that I watch wrestling every Monday night and not something else. I wish I had met him so I could have told him how much I enjoyed his talent. I feel truly sorry for his family, friends and fans. Owen touched so many more people than he ever could have imagined. Or Goldberg. Media Pennsylvania. I was at work Sunday night when a coworker called the office to tell me Owen Hart had died. At first, I thought he was being a dumb mark who had fallen for yet another tasteless wrestling angle, but when he said the local news was reporting it, I was shaken. When I got in my car and turned on the news station, I knew it was real. An underappreciated athlete and performer, a consummate pro and more importantly, a son, brother, husband and father. Of all the deaths, this was the worst. Not just because he was one of my favorite wrestlers, but because it had nothing to do with all the vices that have taken others' lives the last few years. The most sickening thing the day after was listening to talk show hosts spout off stupid jokes. One Rhode Island radio host called him a dummy, and ran down the class and brains of wrestling fans. The Raw show that night was very well done. You can debate whether or not they should have had any wrestling on it, but at least they didn't do storylines and just worked matches to finishes. As far as cancelling the pay-per-view show, I would have, but I made up my mind about that at 11pm and you know about hindsight. Brian Moran, Tiverton Rhode Island. The Raw show on Monday was as real as it can get. Everything that should have been said and done was real. I didn't cry the first time I saw it, but when I rewatched the tape, I broke down. The opening segment of everyone standing together was one of the most depressing images I've ever seen. All the wrestlers who spoke were heartfelt and sincere. Mark Henry, Deborah, Triple H, Road Dog, Patterson and Heckner's crying made me cry. Deborah's comments about taking people for granted is so true. Owen's death is different and touches people in a completely different way. Unlike Rude Gilbert, Pillman Spicoli, Von Erich, John Studd, Rick Wilson and so many others, who have died, Owen wasn't the wrestling death cliché. He didn't have drug problems or depression. It was a totally unnecessary accident that easily could have been avoided, but it's pointless to dwell on the past. He was more concerned about his wife and raising his two children than the backstabbing that plagued the business he worked in. He seemed to be having a good time when he was entertaining the fans. He always had something funny to say or do and never seemed to take anything seriously. It always seems that the most human of people died too early. Ide in Baramani. North Potomac, Maryland. The new observer arrived.